week's highlights. Coming up on the show. Star Singer, presenting the golden voice of French countertenor Philippe Jarowski. Elegant timepieces, artistic Swiss watches courtesy of Michel Parmigiani. Made in Germany, the Peters Company makes high-quality glass designs for buildings the world over. Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Karen Hemstedt. Hi there, and a warm welcome to our Highlights Edition. Well, he's got a voice that literally sends shivers down your spine. Some even say its beauty and perfection is not quite of this world. French singer Philippe Jarouski is a countertenor, and as a rare breed, he's even rarer, as his vocal range is higher than most, about the equivalent of a soprano. Now, a great deal of Baroque music was written with falsetto voices in mind and with CDs like Heroes and Caristini. Jarouski has contributed to a real revival of early music, even though he's blessed with a much broader repertoire. He's often compared to sopranos like Cecilia Bartoli and Anna Netrebko because of his vocal range. Philippe Jarowski's virtuosity was twice recognized by an international panel of judges. He received a classical award in the category for Baroque music and the award for Exceptional Artist of the Year. I'm very honored by this prize. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, particularly because for me, uh, it's me it means that concertinos are finally more and more accepted in the marvelous uh, family of lyric voices. <laughs> Countertenors tend to feel most at home with Baroque music. 18th century composers dedicated a great number of arias to their vocal range, and Philippe Jarowski selected some for his latest album, Carostini, in which his voice reaches some breathtaking heights. In 2008, Jarowski received the German Echo Classical Award. I think Baroque is really a, a, good, a good school for each uh, musician to, to really to learn uh, liberty, to learn uh, responsibility uh, in front of a, of a score and uh, to develop imagination. Jarowski doesn't limit himself to Baroque music. His search for new challenges led him to the Belle Epoque. For his latest album, the countertenor recorded French songs from the 19th century, including compositions by Reynaldo Hahn. The album, called Opium, will be released in March. It might be viewed as surprising for a countertenor to sing these French melodies. Obviously, the French composers of the late 19th and early 20th century were not familiar with the countertenor voice. It had not been rediscovered then. And the repertoire is not based on virtuosity. It's a repertoire that's based on the text. The feelings are subtle, and it's a real challenge to render all those colors vocally. The 30-year-old has been singing in this vocal range for the past 12 years. During this time, he has recorded seven albums and has toured Japan and Brazil to sold-out concert halls. Jarowski never tires of touring, and he especially loves the rehearsals. It's a moment when I have the, a lot of ideas. I, I, want, I, am, I always want to, to say something. And what I did with the orchestra just uh, during the rehearsal, how we have to do this, this end piano. And sometimes it's, it's difficult because um, I'm a singer, I'm not a conductor, and sometimes there is a conductor, and uh, all, sometimes all is very strict, it's not the case. 
here I can say something directly to the orchestra. I really like to, to speak directly to the orchestra. Countertenor Philippe Jarowski has gained recognition all over Europe and is now aiming for a place on the international stage. And now to a more hands-on art. They say too many cooks spoil the broth, but no one was too worried about that this week in Madrid, where some 200 of the world's top chefs gathered for a gourmet and catering convention. It was a good chance to talk shop over the latest gourmet trends, exchange some recipes, and also to show off their cooking skills, which they did with appropriate flair. <laughs> Inspiring and informative, cookery shows are popular everywhere. The Madrid Fusion Trade Fair shows that Spain is home to fine cuisine. Ana Gago, a restaurateur from Galicia, northern Spain, is making her first appearance before an audience. I'm calmer now. I was nervous earlier, but once I've gotten into a routine, everything's fine. But I might get nervous again when I see the people sitting out there. She shares the kitchen with other chefs from Galicia. Ana Gago is preparing hake. The 55-year-old is not afraid of competition. The customers decide where they want to go and whose food they want to eat. I don't believe in competition between chefs at all. Anna explains every step of the preparation of her hake a la gallega to the audience. The freshly caught fish was delivered by taxi and the remaining ingredients come from Galicia. Anna shares some secrets of the regional cuisine with the audience. She herself learned her skills from her mother-in-law, who was also responsible for introducing her to the first degustation menu, a selection of small dishes to try out long before it became fashionable. Ana Gago was awarded her first Michelin star in 1966 and she has cooked for the Spanish royal family. She masters her premiere at Madrid Fusion effortlessly. She thought it went well and her son Eduardo agrees. And of course, Ferran Adria, one of the world's most influential chefs, is also at Madrid Fusion. He's not at the stove today, he's here to discuss molecular cuisine, said to be the logical fusion between science and the art of cookery. Another step, no more. Ana Gago listens carefully. Molecular cuisine sounds very complicated, but perhaps it's this fusion between science and cuisine that all chefs need, starting with the equipment and going right up to the products. Because without machines in the kitchen, we could never serve so many people. But there are also other ways. A sharp knife and a delicious air-dried ham carved as it has been for centuries. This traditional Spanish product is also at the trade fair. Anagago is fascinated by the quality of products that she sees and tries. Olive oil is the central theme for all flavors. It must radiate the perfume and aid its development. Trying, tasting, discovering new producers and products and making themselves known. Every year, these top chefs and their suppliers meet up at Madrid Fusion. Even something as basic as bread can be a special treat. And Ana Gago discovers how quickly Madrid Fusion can raise a chef's profile after her cookery show. Before she returns to Galicia, she looks at the latest cookery books. Even top chefs find them useful for finding new ideas and techniques.
And now it's over to Switzerland, which is famous for its mountains, banks, good chocolate, and of course, fine watches. And indeed, the Geneva Luxury Watch Convention took place this past week in what is known as Watch Valley, just outside the city. Now that's where Michel Parmigiani plies his trade. He's a relative newcomer to the luxury watch business, and despite or perhaps because of some of his more unconventional designs, he's reached the top of the field in just 12 years. Small mechanical masterpieces by Michel Parmigiani. Watches have been his passion for over 30 years. The watchmaker is one of the best in the profession. Parmigiani and his team produce between four and 6,000 watches a year. Exclusive luxury chronometers built to the highest standard of precision. The least expensive costs 8,000 euros. A custom-made watch can run up to 600,000 euros. We do a lot of one-of-a-kind and custom watches, so we pay a lot of attention to the aesthetic quality of the technology. The case back can be engraved, enameled, or like this watch, a semi-open dial. This watch has a double casing to protect the interior mechanics and watch workings. The timer marks the hours, quarter hours and the minutes. And here's an alarm. These valleys in the Swiss canton of Jura have been dubbed Watch Valley, or the cradle of time. But sometimes it seems like the land time forgot. People in this rural region make their living as farmers, and for the past 300 years or so, also as watchmakers. This museum shows what the very first watch workshops looked like. The town of Fleurier is one of the watchmaking hubs. Parmigiani Fleurier has its headquarters here, along with seven production sites. A single watch is often months in the making. Despite the most modern production methods, the key to the process is the handcrafting. We have an industrial process with a lot of high technology and modern machinery. But the final touch, the last bit of polish, the final finish on all the most important components, that's all done by hand. The name Parmigiani stands for innovation and tradition. The master watchmaker is also known for his work restoring antique watches, some more than hundreds of years old. The watch museum of Locle is just down the road from Fleurier. The collection includes many fascinating watches, pendulum clocks, and clocks with automata. Michel Parmigiani restored some of these clocks early in his career. Private collectors and museums still commission his company for repairs. Every piece of work and every replacement part is carefully documented. Our restoration work is part of our company's trademark, part of our history. It's part of this company's soul. One of the most exciting watches is this Bugatti model, named after the famous auto manufacturer. Parmigiani was inspired by the precision engine block on the new Bugatti Veyron model to create this wristwatch that looks like a miniature engine block. This is how we came up with the idea for the Bugatti watch. It has this exquisite motor block and the clockwork is cylindrical. It's not like a conventional watch. And it's not just excellent for driving, it's excellent for the boardroom too. You don't have to move your arm to see the watch. Parmigiani Fleurier, one of the premier watchmakers in the world. These miniature masterpieces come at a steep price, but for true lovers of the art of watchmaking, it's a price worth paying. 
Well, price is one of those concepts that doesn't always figure into the equation when faced with the work of Hussein Chalayan, the British-Turkish Cypriot designer who has his fingers in many pies as a concept artist, fashion designer, and even as a filmmaker. Twice named British Fashion Designer of the Year, Chalayan is famous for his innovative use of materials and his high-tech approach to fashion. Well, if that's a bit hard to visualize, London's Design Museum is now showing a retrospective of his work entitled from fashion and back. This is a fashion presentation that looks a lot more at home in a museum than it does on the catwalk. That's because Hussein Chalayan does much more than just design clothes. He's inspired by architectural theories, science and technology. And he strongly believes that what we wear has cultural significance. Because I see really fashion as a, as a part of culture, I think I don't really see it as this sort of isolated kind of island which most people do. They think of the fashion world as, as sort of this exclusive, glamorous thing, which it is partly, but actually it is a part of our lives. His designs are not just about clothes, it sort of brings in DNA and space travel and physics, but when you look beneath, you know, say the presentation, the structure, the construction um, and the design of the clothes is incredibly technical and the tailoring is, is very, very precise and there are things to wear. The exhibition opening was a high profile event for the world media. Hussein Chalayan has a reputation for exciting, revolutionary and even philosophical designs. His inventions have been at the heart of many memorable fashion moments. Such as on this catwalk in 2000 that told the story of fashion. Dresses were transformed by remote control. This was about um, the last 111 years of fashion and how the political atmosphere or the social atmosphere in a, in, in a given place could affect the way we dress. The really big breakthrough for the 38-year-old was in 2005, when he represented Turkey at the Venice Biennale. His video, featuring British actress Tilda Swinton, portrayed a woman in search of her identity. Chalayan was born in Cyprus, but has been living in London since the age of 12. He has always drawn inspiration from combining different cultures. Not just in his clothing lines, but also in Place to Passage, a short film that addresses the influence of speed and technology on the human mind. Uh, it's about the amount of time we're traveling and the uh, amount of time we're spending in vessels. It, it did actually mark a lot of my uh, ideas. It was quite complete, uh, but um, yeah, it, it, I could have also done a collection based on the same idea. But nothing characterizes Chalayan's work as much as his use of unusual materials, such as a thousand LED lights in combination with crystal or red laser beams. An interest that he now plans to put into practice as creative director for Puma. He's a very, very creative person and someone who really pushes the boundaries with his inspiration, with his ideas. And we want to use this creativity for Puma. Fashion celebrates the body, and body is the most important thing in, our, you know, in life. It's the ultimate cultural symbol. So I guess it's, uh, you know, super unifying. London's prestigious design museum offers a comprehensive presentation of work by this unique artist, filmmaker and fashion designer. Well, many centuries ago, the initial purpose of a stained glass church window was to illustrate the stories of the Bible for those who couldn't read. Today, stained glass can be admired on all kinds of buildings, and many of the best and most intricate creations come from a family firm that's based in Parabon, the Peters Stained Glass Company, which has been in the business for nearly a century. This unique artwork by international designers is produced by the small glass painting company Peters in the western German city of Paderborn.
68 artists work here on the company's various projects, including a glass facade for a courthouse in Hawaii, a light strip for the Belgian artist Joost Kahn, and the restoration of a 19th century stained glass window in Bavaria. The company's trademark is artistic diversity. Heading the company in its third generation is Wilhelm Peters, who loves his profession. We work with light and light refractions. The artist Jan Ton Pricko once said this wonderful sentence about the art of glass painting. Glass painting means painting with the sun itself. That inspires us to incorporate light into what we're producing and to make it reflect in our work. Wilhelm Peter's grandfather Otto founded the Westphalian Art Institute for Glass Painting and Art Glazing in 1912. He specialized in restoring stained glass windows in the region. In the next generation, Emil Peters began working on commissions from as far afield as Beirut and Washington. From Reykjavik in Ireland to Taiwan, examples of Peta's work can be found all over the world. And demand for modern glass art is increasing. We believe that more and more people want buildings to be individualized. They want to give their houses a special edge, both on the inside and the outside. This is something that's really important to us because it means that more glass painting is used in contemporary architecture. According to Wilhelm Peter's son, Jan, the glass of the future should not only aim to make buildings more colorful, but they should also be more environmentally friendly. These photovoltaic elements will be used for the facade of a school in the United States. They produce their own electricity and show that modern technology can also be very green. Eco-friendly or simply a pleasure to the eye, the artistic creations by this glass painting factory in Paderborn are bound to be popular for many years to come. And don't forget, if you'd like to see some of those reports again, you can find them on YouTube. Just go to the internet site that you can see blended in on your screen currently. That's all from us. And until we meet again, alles Gute to you from Berlin. And bye-bye. And say, look, that's us. Gaiman has published more than 50 books, and not just depicting chickens. His cartoons regularly appear in magazines and newspapers, but he tends to steer clear of politics. He's more concerned with human behavior. Since the early 1990s, Gaiman has lived and worked in Cologne. From there, he regularly travels home to southern Germany. He was born and raised in Freiburg, and that's where he first developed his passion for drawing. 
Die Franzosen oder auch die Belgier und so weiter, die haben ja auch The French and the Belgians tend to have a whole different attitude regarding the cartoon genre. Germany still has a bit of catching up to do. Here we do have a fan base, but it's still not making a mark on the genre the way it does in other countries. I think it might be something French. In France, cartoonists are considered to be real artists. Whether he's an artist or not, Peter Geimann's pictures are well received everywhere. He publishes two or three new collections a year. Some of them have sold up to 20,000 copies. And that's certainly not chicken feed. And don't forget, if you'd like to see some of those reports again, you can find them on YouTube. Just go to the internet site that you can see blended in on your screen currently. That's all from us. And until we meet again, alles Gute to you from Berlin and bye-bye.